I believe that this is a Kairos moment for racial justice for God's people. That makes it a moment of crisis and opportunity. And a failure to engage would mean missing some of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our world today. And if you're wondering what a Kairos moment looks like, I've just about reached it. It's the moment to act. I won't pretend that conversations on issues like race are easy. On the contrary, they're frequently packed with pain, guilt and frustration. Transformation in this area is challenging, but this is our watch. We have been entrusted with leading God's people beyond the storm. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is far more invested in this and is always in the room with us. Of course, our Kairos moment is neither God's first nor God's last. Um, I want to visit a pivotal Kairos moment in the New Testament and reflect on what church leaders can do to transform a racialized world. Much of what I share today applies not only to a world divided by ideas of race, but to also to other social challenges from poverty, trafficking, domestic abuse, to dysfunctional thinking about the environment. And the passage I'm going to focus on is Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. I'm reading from the New International Version. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the first leadership principle for transforming a racialized world is that we've got to start with the church. In this scenario, we're made aware of five specific groups, Greek speaking believers, the Hellenistic Jews, Hebrew speaking believers, Hebraic Jews, the apostles, who also happened to be Hebrew speaking believers, the church and the seven who were entrusted with ensuring that action was taken. The Hellenists or Greek speaking believers were foreign Jews from the diaspora, born and raised in Greek speaking countries outside of Israel. They'd adopted Greek ways, dress and language, uh, whereas the Hebrew believers were native Jews, born and raised in Israel. They spoke Hebrew and Aramaic and kept to the old traditions of Judaism, including in their dress style. Crucially, they also considered theirs the purer expression of faith. This was reflected in the unspoken attitude of superiority and entitlement that was ingrained in the majority Hebrew culture of their society. Unfortunately, this same thinking, behavior and activity inevitably emerged uh, within the church because wherever people are concerned, what's in the world tends to show up in the church. In the UK, people who look like me die earlier, four times more likely when it comes to COVID-19, not because it attaches to some mysterious race gene, but because the cumulative effects of racialization leave us more susceptible to the virus. We're twice as likely to be unemployed or to live in overcrowded conditions, 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched by police, four times more likely to be tasered and incarcerated. We make up just under 4% of the population and yet we account for 12% of the prison population. Not because we harbor more criminal tendencies than white people, but because we're more likely to be imprisoned for something a white person would not be. We're also significantly less likely to be shortlisted for a job interview or a housing opportunity, especially if we have a non-Western sounding name. And one in every two of our families experience poverty compared to one in every five white families in the UK. The reality is that as a nation, we have long valued some bodies over others, men over women, the rich over the poor, Christians over Jewish, white over black, and inevitably what's in the world has shown up in the church. My father was among 
the generation of black men who were turned away by UK churches because he didn't look the part. It took until a few years before his death for him to barely recover his faith. Some church leaders struggle to believe that racism is an issue for them because it isn't expressed in this way today, or because they minister in relatively monocultural contexts among people who pretty much look like them, believe like them, sound like them, and act like them. And yet anyone who reads a national newspaper or watches the daily news is already interacting with cultural and ethnic diversity on a global scale. They're already forming opinions, developing mindsets that are seldom informed by biblical principles or shaped by biblical values, leading inevitably to unbiblical responses. Then there are those who believe their churches are wonderfully happy families because they never hear about such things being spoken about. Romans 12 is a reminder that renewing our minds is critical because we and our people have already absorbed the kind of thinking that leads to Acts 6 scenarios. The Hebrew speaking believers were blissfully unaware of what they were allowing to happen in their midst. Even the apostles, Hebrew speaking believers themselves, hadn't noticed until it was brought to their attention. It's unlikely that their actions were deliberate, conscious or knowing, but it didn't stop the same ugly, ethnocentric, xenophobic and elitist behaviours that existed in general society from being replicated in individual behaviours and church structures. Now, different translations describe the problem as the Hellenistic widows were being overlooked, discriminated against, neglected. Clearly, whatever was going on was negative, life-threatening, systemic and pervasive, and the Hellenists were unhappy enough to make their voices heard. The way the discrimination is spilled over is also important to note, because in Jewish law, without willing male relatives, widows had no means of support. By taking responsibility for their widows, the widows in the midst of the church, the early church pioneered one of the first recognisable social welfare programmes. And it was precisely as the church was trying to do something right that they discovered that something was very wrong. In fact, this passage could just as easily begin in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Um, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food and we discovered they weren't wrong. Here we see the critical need for social justice emerging alongside the critical need for social welfare. The Bible recognises social sin, not just personal sin. It recognises structural oppression and not just individual actions. It highlights what we omit and not just what we commit. In some ways, individual bigotry and prejudice is the least of our problems. They're easier to spot and ironically, they're easier to deal with. So the second leadership principle for transforming a racialized world is don't get distracted from the real issues. Now, I sometimes have to say to dominant groups I work with on diversity issues, let's get beyond your feeling bad, guilty, fearful, or whatever the, the distraction appears to be, and get focused on changing things. Act 6 helps us to realise that challenges like racialization are always structural and social, not just or even primarily personal. They are always about power, which groups have it and which do not resources, which group gets to acquire and control them and which do not, legitimacy, who is accorded respect, authority and assumptions of competence and who is not. Throughout the Bible, God identifies groups who are regularly denied power, resources, respect and authority. These groups are disproportionately vulnerable to injustice and disproportionately victims of injustice. They're sometimes described as the quartet of the vulnerable. They include widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. These groups are excluded from economic opportunities, social justice. They're also the physically and materially exploited and marginalized. God is constantly reminding his own people, as well as the surrounding nations, that widows' lives matter, orphans' lives matter, immigrants' lives matter, poor lives matter, because unfortunately, sometimes both Israel and the nations behaved as if those lives didn't matter at all. 
These reminders lead us on to the third leadership principle, that those least impacted by structural discrimination are often most unaware of it. It's worth noting that in Acts 6, it was the Hellenists, not the Hebrews, who noticed the persistent pattern of discrimination. And even as hard feelings and resentment began to arise among them, it was the Hellenists themselves who had to make their voices heard. In other words, people who benefit from the status quo of structural discrimination seldom notice it because they're not negatively impacted by it. I call this the curse of privilege. Someone described privilege like this. We largely do not recognize the structural access we enjoy, the trust we think we deserve, the assumption that we always belong and do not have to earn our belonging. All this we take for granted as normal. Only the outsider can spot these attitudes in us. So how do you think the apostles dealt with this? Maybe they said, oh, the Hellenists, they're just imagining it. They always play the Hellenist card. I think it's a foreign thing. I can't see what they're going on about, can you? Don't they know we love them? This is not a gospel priority. Let's ignore it. Maybe it'll go away. But that's the problem. These things don't go away. They go underground, they smolder. They create resentment, distrust, deep-seated conflict. They destroy the very thing we're invited to model as followers of Jesus through the church as family. But conflict presents opportunity as well as danger. Thankfully, Acts 6 turned out to be one of those revealed to redeem moments. The Holy Spirit not only revealed a problem, he also equipped the believers to resolve an issue that their entire society had no answer for. Individual churches can grow to a certain stage with these attitudes and destructive cultural patterns intact, but then they begin to lose credibility and moral authority. Perhaps this is also the case for the global church. I've often wondered why over a uh, hundred years after arguably the most famous missions conference in history, the Edinburgh 1910 World Missionary Conference, why the proportion of Christians in a world whose population has since tripled has remained at 30%. In other words, exactly the same as in 1910. Something happened in Act 6 that is only slowly beginning to happen in UK churches. We see it in the actions of the apostles who engaged in what some today describe as allyship or radical solidarity. That's the idea from Romans 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And it's epitomized in the fourth leadership principle for transforming a racialized world. The apostles in this story behave like allies. They belong to the dominant group, but once the matter is brought to their attention, they respond by using their influence and their privilege to facilitate change. They effectively declare Hellenist lives matter, not because Hebrew lives don't matter, but because right now it's Hellenist lives that are at stake, that are disadvantaged, that are endangered. They initiate a turnaround, or what Christians call repentance, and they involve every part, the entire church, in the suffering of those brothers and sisters. In the words of one leader, Romans 12, 15 instructs us to weep with those who weep, not to justify why we aren't weeping or to correct those who weep. To weep with, we need to feel the pain. To feel the pain, we need to understand. To understand, we need to be informed. To be informed, we need to listen, read, watch, learn. And as we listen, read, watch and learn, we can use our influence to change things. This presents a particular challenge for church leaders who are senior decision makers, especially if you're part of the dominant group. What do you do when you suspect systemic racism and how do you challenge it? This leads to the fifth leadership principle for transforming a racialized world. You'll need a Holy Spirit inspired vision. Without it, whatever you attempt today will tie you out or be a passing fad tomorrow. This stuff is hard work, and you will need a vision of what things could look like if they were already transformed. Now, the early church didn't need to sit down to devise a vision. 
They just needed to recall the events of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when that multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multinational, mixed gender gathering was powerfully impacted by the preaching of Peter and the influence of the Holy Spirit. All they needed was a reminder of Peter's Holy Spirit inspired recollection of Joel's vision as he tried to explain what the crowds were witnessing, which concluded with, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All they needed was the reminder that the unimaginable was all possible with God, even in a culture that had little time or esteem for children, youth or women. And as for foreigners, well, Dare we reimagine what things would look like if they were already transformed? Because without a commitment to a Holy Spirit inspired out of the box vision to embolden our faith and energize our efforts, they will prove unsustainable. That recommitment to a Holy Spirit inspired vision energizes the sixth leadership principle for transforming a racialized world, taking bold action. Unfortunately, the Pentecost party lasted less than five years before the unspoken attitudes of superiority and entitlement ingrained in the majority Hebrew culture spilled over into discriminatory practices within the church. But just look at how the apostles dealt with their version of a racialized church. First, they brought the issue to the attention of the entire church community so everyone could see it for what it was. Second, they proposed a bold solution, partly designed to ensure they didn't take their eyes off yet another ball, and partly designed to ensure that the problem was being dealt with properly. Third, their bold solution addressed the power, resource and legitimacy inequities I mentioned earlier. They committed to considerable people resources and then invested them with their own authority by laying hands on them in front of everyone. They also ensured that the whole church took ownership and responsibility for the decision to put forward the best people they had to offer. Act 6, 4, friends, choose seven men from among you. 5, the congregation thought this was a great idea. They went ahead and chose. Interestingly, they ended up entrusting the welfare of all the widows to the Hellenists, as all those chosen had Greek names. Now, in our politically correct environment, we would opt for parity. We'd say, let's make half of the team Jews and half Greeks, half traditionalists and half new church, half men and half women, half young and half old. In fact, the entire church responded so radically that 15 years later, the leadership of the new church, um, of the, the center of uh, church activity in Antioch that was now in Antioch, was more diverse than ever before. Take a look at Acts 13 from verse 1. There were Hellenist and Hebraic Jews and Gentiles from Southern Europe, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. They spoke Aramaic, Greek and many other languages and they stood out in a city that was characterized by race and ethnic tensions, race riots. This was so different to anything people had seen before that it was here that followers of Jesus were first labeled Christians. That odd lot who claim Christ is in them. And it's the Antioch model that became the model for the expansion of the early church, a model we in today's church have pretty much lost sight of, perhaps until now. Acts 13 would not have been possible without the bold, faith-filled solution of Acts 6, all taking place before their society's watchful gaze. What is society watching unfold in your church? I love the way Vernia Myers describes the challenge. She says, diversity is being invited to the party. Equity is making it possible for you to get there. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And belonging is dancing as if you don't care who's watching. In other words, when all your diverse leaders, church members, youth and children feel invited to the party, when you've employed all necessary resources to get them there, when they've been asked to dance, and when they're dancing as if they don't care who's watching, we can celebrate the final leadership principle that only a transformed church transforms mission and transforms its world. Act 6 is often used to illustrate the need for distributed leadership or the importance of social welfare and serving the poor. 
But we should also note that while at the beginning of Acts 6, the number of disciples was increasing, by the end of chapter 6, the issue with the issue put right and justice being done in an area their society had no answer for, we're informed the word of God spread, prospered. This means that something more than multiplication was taking place. They were now increasing rapidly because now they enjoyed an ever widening circle of influence. They spread the gospel into people, groups, systems, and structures they had not succeeded in reaching before. Even many priests submitted themselves to the faith. As church leaders, we can be overly preoccupied with multiplication to the detriment of spreading gospel influence. Distributed leadership and service to the poor undoubtedly advances and expands the reach of the gospel, but so does overturning ethnocentrism and promoting social justice. Both among the people of God and at the frontiers of mission. This testimony is repeated throughout the book of Acts. Brothers and sisters, it is really difficult to tell the world to change if we are no more than a mirror image of our society. We have an answer, but we must also be an answer. The early believers transformed their version of a racialized world and renewed their mission by transforming their version of a racialized church. This is what it means for us to lead in our racialized world today.